essentially the, the, the main focus again will be looking at the booking API spec. Um, Nick has been doing some further revisions uh, based on discussion on the last call and follow-ups with um, some of the people in the community. Um, so we'll give an update on that and Nick can run us through uh, the changes and any issues. Um, and then we'll go, if time permitting, um, we'll touch on um, uh, some just kind of notes around implementation and next steps. Um, but we'll, we'll see how far we get through. Um, and then time for any, any of the business that anyone wants to raise at the end. Um, so, um, jumping straight into it, um, Nick published a, 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 the latest update of the spec went out this afternoon. So none of you will have time to have a chance to see it yet. So Nick, do you want to give us an, a summary of what changes you've made and focusing yeah. on bits you want to discuss? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. So, um, and I probably should say hi to Roger. I think he's new. Are you a participant, Roger? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Correct. Oh. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, I heard from uh, from Tara. You guys had a great chat. So, yeah, we did. It's a good good conversation. So, I'm fairly new to this. First, I've seen any of this really. So, I'm just, just trying to take it all on on board at the stage to see, see where things are. No problem. So, I'll, I'll try and, and summarise as we go, so that you can um, kind of get get a bit involved. And um, all right, thanks. Um, no problem. And I must say that there's there's outside of this conversation because we found it quite difficult to get. Uh, everyone on this call to for this particular bit of the spec sometimes we manage to do uh, this round so there's been a few people feeding in in between uh, thanks Ian uh, for, for your contributions and um, uh, also um, Joe from Book When and uh, Ray uh, from Clarity uh, were two uh, other uh, major contributors to their thinking um, but other people have been chipping in bits and bobs as well so um, what I'm hopeful, hopeful we'll have at the end of this is something that at a high level we all agree is kind of a good MVP uh, as a booking spec and then we can make sure that, that we can circulate that and get the detail from anyone else that might have uh, feedback on, on detail but I think hopefully this satisfies what I understand as being the main requirements. Um, so uh, to jump into it um, maybe uh, Lee actually if you jump to that slide that I had um, first that might be just for Roger's benefit, a better place to sure. start. Yeah, perfect. Um, so basically, this is quite good because it breaks out the kind of key um, high-level requirements in inverted commas. Another way, way of saying that is the bits you'd need to build to implement this um, as, a, as a booking system. And so um, what it really comes down to is a mechanism for creating a new, what we call it an order, which is just a, a way of booking. So an order contains a number of order items, like a shopping basket, you can uh, complete that order as an atomic transaction. So um, it gets completed and then uh, is confirmed and there's payment in there as well. Uh, not, not as part of the spec, but that, that part of the process involves taking payment. Um, and then there's these two other things which are uh, put in the kind of required category, which is seller cancellation. So allowing for seller uh, side cancellation so they can trigger that and then the refund can be processed uh, as a result. Um, of that happening and then the customer cancellation uh, which is a, a quite a similar process both of those trigger refunds uh, and then finally there's this optional kind of leasing bit which means um, while I'm while there's something in my shopping basket making sure that um, people can't steal it from me so uh, other people who might be booking on the site at the same time can't take the last space in a, in a yoga class for example um, so, so jumping into some of the detail here, um, uh, does that make sense as a high level, Roger, what we're kind of... Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's what kind of a uh, uh, summary of what Tara was, and I were talking about last week. Perfect, excellent, that's, that's really great. Um, so if we jump straight into this, into um, what I'll start with is just the changes that we've made as a result of the conversation to the, to the booking journey that, that others on the call will be familiar with. So 5.2, if you jump to there, um, this is the, the kind of main booking journey, which includes checkpoint one, two, and, and then book. The idea here is that you go through a process of uh, checking your basket, getting the, the total amount, including tax, uh, that that basket is worth. And then when you, um, and we call that a quote, and when you want to then complete that transaction, you take that whole, um, all the items in that quote, and you put them through as an order, and that gives you the booking. 
And the idea is that when you get your quote, that's enough information you can use to take a payment and authorize that. And then when you've completed the booking, you can capture that payment. It's a two-step process. Um, the change we've made is if you go down to the next diagram in this uh, series of diagrams, um, is we've added this little bit at the bottom here, uh, which basically says at the very end, when you've completed and captured the payment, we then, uh, there's, there, it posts the order that was generated to the RPDE feed with a status of order complete for the order items. Um, and so that's the, that's the first main thing. And that allows the broker to generate invoices and notify customers accordingly. All those things about VAT receipts we previously talked about. So it's kind of, the, the key thing there is stressing that the broker's responsible for those two, those two things and that they will only do it as a response to the RPDE feed. They won't do it uh, using the information that comes back from the order. Uh, they'll, they'll wait for the RPDE feed to be updated. Um, and what that, has, uh, what that does and what we have consistently through this whole spec now is that the RPDE feed, um, when it's updated, is the, the place that triggers notifications always. And it's always also the place that triggers um, refunds. And so there's one consistent mechanism for doing that. Um, so uh, going, going on through this then. To... Sorry, Nick, just a quick question there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, would there be any difference between the information that would come back from the order and what would be in the RPD feed? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, uh, it's a slightly more detailed uh, answer, that, um, but but to, to, to answer it, that the um, uh, one of the other assumptions uh, the spec currently makes is that the in order to to basically simplify this as much as possible for the implementer, it might not always be the case the implementer has got the concept of an order at all. They might just have order items, and so it's permissible um, that the order when it's returned from the post, and it doesn't have to be the way, it, it could be either way, um, but there, there's no strict requirement that the order that gets returned from the post of the of B is the same as the order that comes out of the RPDE feed. And what I mean by that is, although the items themselves must be the same, uh, the, item, the order can be broken up into it, the items can be broken up into a number of orders. So if you post an order for five things, that could come out in the RPDE feed as five orders or one order. Um, but it actually doesn't matter because the RPDE feed is what's being used as the kind of point of truth. And so the order really at, the, at B represents the transaction. This is the, this is the thing that's completed atomically. It's done. And when that's completed, um, that the ID, there isn't an ID of that order. So it doesn't persist as it is in that state. The only way you'll get the ID of that order to do anything further with it is by listening to the RPDE feed. And that's where you get that information from. And that separation of concerns <coughs> potentially simplifies the um, implementation. Uh, Nick, hi. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, okay, you're smiling so you can hear me. Yes. Well, maybe you're smiling so you can hear me. Um, <laughs> I got a couple of questions about that. One is vaguely technical, which is that um, if I submit an order with three items on it, mm -hmm. and I get back three orders with one item in each, What's the keying for that? You've obviously got the um, uh, GUID, which qualifies the, the, the meta order, mm -hmm. but how do you actually specify uh, and identify the, um, the, 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 the sub orders and how they relate to um, the main order within that? Yes, that's, I like the meta order. That's probably that's a more helpful way of explaining it. Yes, so the, the meta order, um, the, the GUID on that is just purely, it's a throwaway GUID. It only exists for the purposes of the order quote and the order in the initial <coughs> interaction, item potency, et cetera. Um, so as soon as that's completed, um, that GUID, it could persist. There's nothing to stop it persisting, but it's not a requirement that it does persist. So for example, if, if the, in a simple implementation, you wanted to use that GUID, uh, not do leasing, you would effectively ignore the GUID completely. Um, and then when you come to process the order, you might generate several order um, orders, one for each order item. Um, and, and at that point, the IDs would be present in the, in the feed. So the RPDE feed pr produces the IDs. Um, but surely you need to have, you know, the, the, um, the broker is creating an order and it then goes off into limbo and then something comes back. They must be able to link back to the order they created that they, that they registered with the, uh, provide the booking system. 
uh, in these fragments to come back. Otherwise, yeah. how are they going to correlate it? And if they want to be able to say to uh, the customer, here's your tax invoice, they don't want to say, here's three tax invoices, we think you're the same customer. So I think we do need to have that. Yeah, right. I, I, was, I, I would also suggest you need to make that persistent, that, that GUI. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. The operation, sorry, yeah, Lee's agreeing with me, sir. I must be right. <laughs> Not necessarily the case, but I, I am agreeing with you in this case. Because, I mean, I'd separately, I'd written down that one of the things that um, the, the booking system must do is retain that UUID because we didn't want it to be recycled or reused anywhere. Interesting. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise there's a chance that you get, um, given that C1, C2 can happen at different, you know, repeatedly, there's just potential if that things get recycled accidentally. So I think they have to be persisted. Um, and my, I mean, I can, I can, maybe this is more detail than you want to go into now, so I can defer comments till later, but it feels like um, what you've ended up doing is, is exposing some of the details of the implementation that people might handle orders differently to every broker in this case, whereas you could easily have just said, if a uh, booking system doesn't have, it is going to create separate individual orders for every individual item, then it just needs to reconstitute that when it produces the RPD feed. It, you can have exactly the same flexibility on the booking system side without exposing that, that kind of fragmentation of the data. Oh, I see. Okay, so the reason for that is that the, um, the way the RPD feed, if you were going to, if you were going to, to um, generate the RPD feed off of the uh, just booking table, just the normal booking table, um, with just um, without having any kind of um, grouping. So, so it's difficult to generate an RPD feed from a, a table with grouping because of the way that the um, you, the way you need to store the state. Um, and so that basically means that you can um, you can separate the you can you can separate the orders out if you want to to separate the RPD in, in the RPD feed. Okay. Um, okay, I, I think I see what you're saying. But um, again, it, it may be that it's a feed of order items rather than orders. Uh, and the order yeah. items have a, have a unique, tra you know, unique transaction ID, which at the moment, it's the UUID is the consistent ID that is shared on both sides of the system. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, we could do, we could, we could have a, a feed of order items. Yeah. Um, okay. um, so I, I don't want so, so that I guess that's one issue we can, we can we can take that yeah okay great okay thank you yes well um that was that was what i thought might be probably the most controversial of the things so i'm glad that you guys both picked up on that immediately um because uh, that was it's difficult because it's a kind of trade-off between um making it slightly more complicated to implement but more consistent um and i guess that's that's the trade-off we need to, to decide on is what what level of complexity we want to uh to enforce on the implementer um, is uh, two things. One is I want to talk. I want to talk about the dynamics of the feed at some point. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, if the cancellation charge um, or the, the point of free cancellation passes, do you emit that, and do you expect to see that emitted in the feed? We may come to that later, um, mm. but that's something that I'm not clear about. Uh, the other thing is um, looking at the example orders. I. I Maybe, I think you might have asked this question before. There's an awful lot of information there that doesn't seem to be useful. So, you know, you've got um, uh, the, the, the broker. Well, the broker knows who the broker is. So you don't need his address. Uh, similarly, the seller, you know, the, the, there's going to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the seller and the broker. Yeah? So you don't need to pass the information about who they are backwards and forwards in full detail with every order. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just that's food for thought. I mean, uh, that's just in passing. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I'll take, I'll take that as well. Orders uh, with uh, lots of detail. Yeah. Okay, excellent. On the cancellation charge, um, there are some issues with uh, adding cancellation charges if we allow arbitrary separation of um, order items, or oh, if order items, if orders can be generated arbitrarily, as, I, as we just discussed, then cancellation charges become slightly more difficult um, to do consistently. So I was going to actually suggest that we remove cancellation charges from the scope, but I don't know, again, if that's something that is, is that, an, is that a must have um, from Legend's perspective, Ian? Could, could I um, uh, revise what I was trying to say there? Um, the point after which you don't get a refund. So right. I, think, 
I think cancellation charges we can do without. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think it'd be fine uh, that there's also the, the problem of collecting the money, <laughs> which becomes another order type thing because you've got to you off it before you then do the cancellation because you might say, well, damn it, I'm not paying five pounds, I'll go anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or not yeah. go anyway, whatever it happens to yeah. be. Yeah. If, yeah. if it's free to cancel up till the day before, mm -hmm. and after yeah. that, they don't get a refund. Yeah. So my question was, at that point, 24 hours before the, the event, would you expect to see an emission in the RDPE feed that says, um, now it's going to be, um, you don't get a refund before that you do? Because uh, if you do, I don't like it. An emission in the RPD feed that says you don't get a refund for... So there is a, so there is a, um, there is a property in um one of the uh it's, there's a property in the in the um order that says about cancellation about whether the cancellation is possible um so in, in it's i think it's something like minimum number of uh, minimum duration before the event starts is the so it was actually a date at which you couldn't cancel or something like that whatever uh, yes something so like that. Is, at that when that point in time occurs mm -hmm. Are you expecting to see that um, change happening in the feed? Uh, no. Good. No. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I agree. Uh, so the, the the reason I said actually that it's it's relative time, not an absolute date, is because with another change that I was going to propose in here um, is that it, it is relative and not absolute, and that was a bit more again a bit more detailed than. Um, and we may have got onto that later, but um, and the reason for that is that the having it as a relative time means that you can do inheritance from the event into the offer uh, and into the so from session series to scheduled sessions and that type of thing. If it's an exact date, that's much less useful for the model um, because you can't um, inherit that as an offer as you usually would with other things because. Um, if you inherit it for an entire series of events and all those uh, have got like a two-day cutoff, you have to generate the actual dates for each of those, which isn't actually that useful to do. Um, so I was going to suggest that we deviate from schema there and just use the relative time, um, which Google Reserve also incidentally does, um, instead of using the uh, actual dates, which saves us updating stuff like that in the RPD feed, as you say. Okay. Um, just to... Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I was I was actually going to uh, ask just jump us back one stage. Um, so some of the some of the change design here, it, uh, as I understand what you've described, is because of of potential implementation issues that for systems that are unable to generate a single order to reflect um, what is actually coming through the API. So the original API design was you generate an order with order items, and that was what um, Persisted. Yeah, that's what persisted that you get notified on. So it seems like in between you know, the last couple of weeks, you've identified some issues with that. So can you clarify where the, you know, which systems have have problems or where those implementation things sure. come from? So yeah, no, I can absolutely do that. Um, it might be also worth us jumping into, and we can come back to this as a topic, because I think this probably is a good, um, a good thing to discuss back and forth. Um, the uh, the main thing that where that, where that came from was um, thinking about trying to so that slide I was going to show later with the absolute minimum implementation and thinking about the exact complexity of each of those components. Um, the uh, idea to simplify that order was thinking about the exact instructions we'd have to give to England Netball, to O2 Touch Rugby, uh, and to those other simple systems and what they'd need to implement. And knowing their systems. Uh, that was me knowing their systems. Um, that was additional instruction we'd have to provide to them in terms of how to generate an order table and, and all that extra work. So that was where that came from. But it wasn't anyone specifically saying, this is too complicated. Um, it was getting ahead of that advice. Um, uh, okay. Could we not have a broker property? Sorry, not a broker property, a, a booking system property of some kind that says uh, single item bookings only? Yeah, and then just force everybody to make those. So, you know, the, of the examples you've given, which can only take one booking at a time, um, let's not confuse things by changing it and say there is a, I don't want to use the word mode because it's a rude word, but you can say I'm a booking system that can only take one. 
Yeah, and then limit it that way. Yeah, uh, or I um, like to comment that slightly differently. But, uh, we've we've been veering uh, between single item orders and multiple item orders over the last three or four iterations of the spec. The original scope was single item orders. Mm -hmm. So if there is some implementation complexity um, in per to, for the purpose of actually getting this first version done, saying we only do single item orders and just uh, leaving it there for now and dealing with any other uh, complexity later, whether that is just on the implementation side or changes to the design, would be another way to resolve that. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the reason that I'm thinking about a, a multi-item order is that one of the use cases is around people booking with their friends. Um, that's that was the main the main thing. And then also, every time we talk about multi-item orders, it causes us to have a, a crisis of design in some way or another, uh, which is which has been helpful so far. I think it's removed a lot of complexity actually, um, because we've ended up, which we'll come on to talk about, removing invoicing completely uh, on the basis of that complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're, we're making the right trade-off that like obviously if some systems aren't able to have multiple order items in a single order um, Do we want that do we want that to be uh, something that has to be surfaced across the whole API design and not everybody who's implementing it? Um, or, or well, just... as I was going to say about OT touch and others is that it although I, I, I do see what you're saying about them accepting one order at once um, but, but there's other examples such as British Cycling that do allow you to, um, well, actually, even, even OT Touch will allow you to do two at once. Um, the difference isn't about whether you can do two orders at once. The difference is just about, as you say, it is an implementation detail about what they need to store. And so it's mainly that the, the advantage of having multiple items in an order is it's atomic. So you can only succeed or fail that whole order, which means if you're booking with your mate, you can't get the situation where one person gets in and the other doesn't and you have to do a cancellation. You're, you're either going to succeed in getting you and your mate in or you're not. Um, and so in the case of uh, British Cycling, for example, where you do have a rider plus one or rider plus however many, um, you, can, you can book that uh, as one atomic thing. But then it might split those out into separate orders in the feed just to simplify the, the feed implementation. That's really all the reason to split it out is um, but the alternative would be to, to, to have them generate a, a new order table for that same feed, which I can see is also reasonable. But for the, okay. Right. Uh, uh, I'm just now wondering why uh, booking with your mates requires two order items rather than a single order item, which is two tickets. Ah, well, that's a good question. So it, it, another thing that's changed, and we know we're jumping around here, so we're trying to... Um, a cover of changes out of order, so it's, it's, it's I was hoping to go through it slightly more structured, but that's okay. Okay, okay. Um, well, no, I mean, if you if you, if you want to take us through it in a specific way, that's fine. I just well, no, I mean, I I'll, I'll cover this this point, and then yeah, we should definitely um, cover the, the bits. Um, but uh, the other, one of the other changes uh, we've we've uh, talked about. Um, so this is the end suggestion actually, uh, which was a really good one. Which is we should get do away with um, the num the order quantity, and so not allow you to book three tickets but actually force you to create three order items. Um, and, and the reason that's actually better and, and simpler is that when you cancel an individual order item, you're cancelling them individually as well. And so you don't have a situation where you say, you know, two are cancelled and one is complete. Um, and so by getting rid of order quantity, that has uh, added a layer of simplicity, but also, as you say rightly, that, you know, that does mean that um, things like booking with your mate you can't just book two tickets, you've got to create two separate order items, which for this version of the spec, to be honest, I don't think it's a big deal having multiple order items in, in the email, in the invoice and things like that, because you're not going to book with more than, you know, even if you book with five or six friends, you'll just have five or six lines in that invoice at this stage. Um, and obviously the uh, broker can simplify that if they want to, because they're generating the invoice, so they can do a group buy and, and figure that out themselves. The only difference between the order items is the, uh, the ID then they know they're all the same thing. Um, so, does that help? Or? Yeah, okay, I, I, I can see why, I can see, see why the suggestions were made here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, just be, so just to cover a, a few quick things at a high level and then absolutely come back to this discussion about the difference between order items and, uh, so whether orders should be consistent, um, and I can see 
so you can see both sides there. Um, so if we scroll down past section six to section seven, um, this one diagram here I wanted to just quickly cover. Um, and so this is, um, everyone seems to be quite aligned on this idea that we actually want to put the booking system, make the booking system responsible for as little as possible. And so um, there's an attempt at making a Venn diagram without actually drawing lots of circles. Um, so apologies if it's not 100% clear. What, what it's trying to illustrate is um, that the broker has visibility of everything. The order, the invoice, the payment, the refunds. Um, the booking system only has vis visibility of the order. It doesn't have any visibility of um, any of the uh, any of the um, invoice information or payment information, um, with, with one exception, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, and so, and and the reason for this is that it may, it massively simplifies. What before we were doing is we were generating orders at, at the booking system level, which has a bunch of assumptions in it, and also then the VAT invoice was actually being sent from the broker anyway. So generating them and sending them from the same place seems to make sense. So putting the invoice and the um, and the VAT uh, receipt generation in the in purely in the broker's hands and the payment and refund linking to that again part of that um, because there's a legal requirement with invoices where when you've generated an invoice it must stay the same you have to version them basically every time you generate a new version of the invoice every time there's a cancellation or a change to the order um, you have to. Uh, generate yeah you have to maintain a new version of that invoice so people have that history and invoices are connected to a payment and the payment has multiple refunds but all of that complexity actually um although there's, there's recommendations in here to keep it simple around invoicing payment and refund uh, and, and the links between them so uh order has uh, a series of invoices which are all versions of the same thing and um, one payment so it's one payment per order and then the payment can have multiple refunds associated with it so if you have three order items in an order, then one payment covers those three, and then you can have three refunds as you refund one of them, at a, each one one at a time, if you were to do them separately. Every time you cancel one item, it generates a refund. Um, so that's, uh, that's the point I was gonna make around that as a, a suggested change. Was, that, um, anyone got any thoughts on that? I think it nicely captures where the responsibilities are. Um, Ian, does it reflect what we talked about as well? Yeah, I was going to agree because as we talked about it already, I think you say, no, Nick, that's a stupid idea. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes. Um, Brilliant. Okay, great. So that's that's roughly what we'd uh, discussed. And so great. So that that helps hopefully simplify some things. So um, maybe this is you could you could touch on this, but I you mentioned uh, where is it? Like in the previous diagram. In the previous diagram, you, uh, it says about um, customer notifications. Um, yes. So yeah. that responsibility is on the broker. The broker as well. I, don't, I was just wondering whether there's a box on diagram. Yeah, or just, or maybe, maybe I'm not sure if this is the right place because uh, I guess the broker is going to notify the um, the customer. I guess they could do it a couple of stages because, uh, and partly depending on the UX of the broker system, right? It, it, you might just want a simple notification. Yeah, your order is complete. Um, whether you want to, how formally you want to notify them or present them with the invoice or uh, updates to the invoice it could be handled in, in different ways. But I guess logically you would expect somebody to be notified that their order is complete mm -hmm. and then perhaps when every time there's an invoice available. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's, uh, that's what that's what this uh, that's what is covered in the other diagrams. Uh, whether we put it in here as well, but that's right. So currently, every time there's a change to the order, it's basically um, notified. Uh, every time an invoice is generated, sorry, more specifically. So I guess maybe yeah, that's probably a good cue to carry on going through. Uh, Could I just um, make a point? Um, you talk about the invoices being one-to-one -one with orders. 
And whilst I agree that that's going to be the case in B2C, it wouldn't necessarily be the case in B2B. So if you're ordering a whole chunk of courses or block bookings or sports courses um, with an automatic process as a business, you wouldn't necessarily expect to get a notification back with a formal VAT invoice for all of them, but rather be invoiced once a month for it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so there's that's so that's suppose the constraint we've got at the moment where there's a payment per order um, might not be. Uh, no, that's right. Actually, that works. So a single payment can span multiple orders, but the reverse isn't true. A order can't be um, uh, paid by multiple payments. That's the assumption that's made here. So it's a an order must have one payment. Uh, payments can be used for multiple orders. Agreed. And just for clarity, uh, an order must have one payment. Payments. Uh, yeah, but that then takes a payment outside the scope of the order, I think. So if you're raising an order, so all that does is tell the, the, the booking system is a debt. Yeah. Um, Yes, it's basically it, all the only assumption this makes is that in the order there's a payment ID. Um, across multiple orders in a B2B context, but it wouldn't be at the same time. Sorry, and we missed the beginning of what you just said there. Yeah, the, the internet's a bit dodgy um, today. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm saying that um, I guess that. So in a B2B context, you might raise number of orders, 30, 40 orders over a month, and then you actually invoice as a broker to the customer once a month. Yeah. Now there's no payment against the order. What you're doing is stating that the payment is external in some way or that the payment hasn't happened yet or something of that kind. Um, the other thing which relates to that is of course, there may be no payment at all because it's a free booking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, this may be getting over complex. I mean, it may well be for the sake of version one, then an order has an invoice, full stop. Well, so at the, at the moment, this doesn't, there's no, there's nothing that says the invoice, the order doesn't reference anything about invoices in the, in the payload. The only thing the order references is a payment identifier. And so because the order has a payment identifier, just one, it must have a payment ID that then is used. Uh, I think we said this before for traceability. So if there's a problem, you know what's 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 connected. But then that could be that same payment could be used in 50, 60 different orders. It could be uh, one invoice or many invoices. Or but but the booking system doesn't care about that. Fair point. Okay, uh, but free certainly uh, is a good point about making. I'll make explicit. We need to make it explicit in there about how how free is handled with the payments. Um, so. Uh, shall I carry on through? Does that make sense uh, to you, Roger, this, this kind of breakdown of responsibility? Yeah, the one thing that, uh, when it says invoice, is that like what everyone thinks about an invoice? You get sent something, you owe us this money. Or is that more like a receipt once payments, could payment be taken at the, at the point of order or not? Uh, either of those. Um, I think the idea is that it's, it's, it is the VAT receipt, so it's more of a receipt, but it could, as Ian says, be an, an invoice that's, you know, payments at the end of the month. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense, because obviously with, with, with our system, the, the person running the event can make a decision whether they allow people to pay by invoice or by card, or, you know, force them to pay one way or the other, or give them the choice of, or give them the option. So if they pay by, if they pay by card there, and then they've got to get a receipt payment if they choose to pay by invoice they're also going to get an invoice saying you know you owe us this money within 30 days or whatever yeah got it yeah um yeah so that should be okay i mean the main thing is because it's outside the scope of the the, the booking system it, it kind of the details of that matter slightly less here um yeah. so, so that's good but that's yeah both both can definitely be uh, possible so um Great. Okay. If there's no other comments on this, should we move on to the next bit? Um, so if you carry on down to the next diagram, which is in uh, 8.2. So this is a cancellation flow. Just taking you through all the diagrams, basically. Um, so the um, can I just, sorry, 
Mm. I do apologise for this, but I have a comment on uh, 7.6, which is above. Ah. We're going to deal with it now. Offer yeah. override. I really wasn't clear what that was about and what the dynamics were. Maybe we shouldn't do that now, but just just so it's a placeholder for you. So yeah. I think we probably need to go through the higher level stuff. But okay, let's come back to that uh, in, in, uh, in ten minutes. Then after we've covered the other, yeah, that sounds good. So, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so cancellation. Following on from what we talked about uh, just now, um, the way the cancellation would then work is that if you've got that the RPDE feed of of items again TBC what the, the makeup of those is but regardless there will be an order in which inside the order there will be a, uh, one or many items um, so the way this works is, is that the broker maintains a synchronized state with the booking system um, and it would have to do that across all the systems it's integrating with um, that allows it to present stuff uh, to the user such as these are the orders I have uh, in one place uh, and if someone chooses to cancel one of those orders from one of the many systems they may be from, and they know they can cancel it because there's a flag allow simple cancellation is true, um, which means that they can indeed uh, cancel it. Um, and uh, then that's, uh, that has to be within the cancellation. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to be, uh, uh, we discussed, energy. which is not clear. Yeah, but I'll, I'll make sure it's clear. Um, yeah, I think you need to have the cancellation um, rule within that feed mm -hmm. uh, you either going to have to take a cancellation rule from the rp the, the order um order creation point or yeah. any amendments needs to be in that because it's quite possible that the cancellation rules change so in fact we're saying you can cancel up to an hour in advance but then people get they like that so you, you make it two hours in advance or something like that so Mm. Um, I don't know how we do that, model that in terms of the feed, and my suggestion would be, well, so that's just a bit of an issue with the... Um, no, that's good, that's, uh, I think that's right, it, it, the window should be in the feed, however yeah, that's done, yeah, uh, and that. the rules, so that, and, um, and that allows also for the UX to display only those that are possible to cancel uh, in, the, in the list of, of things, um, so um, yeah. the synchronized state can include that as well. Yeah. Roger, Roger, um, yeah. 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 Rude, but you yeah. to mute yeah. while you're not talking because there's lots of background noise coming from your side. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, oh, good. Yeah, so I've, I've hidden it now. Um, I'll just say um, one of our developers to quickly fix it. Ah, it is Roger. Ha. Sorry, Roger, I didn't realise that. Um, I've just pressed mute, but you're very welcome to unmute um, at any point, of course. Um, so. Uh, so that's that, yeah. And then, uh, in, in order to uh, to go for the maximum simplicity here, uh, what I'm proposed is that we just use a delete. I know this was from a ver previous version, but we basically just get just uh, pr just a single delete against the order item ID. So it's only allowed at the order item level, not the order level. If you want to cancel an order, you have to cancel all the items in it, uh, and that will effectively cancel the order. Um, and just in terms of making it as simple as possible to implement. There's an argument we should also allow order level cancellation as well to cancel the whole order. Um, uh, the only reason that's not there is just to keep it very, very simple. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I think having a whole level order cancellation is uh, would be useful. Um, but as a required thing, do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. One thing, I mean, I, I, again, I kind of want to make sure that we're getting the right balance between perceived cost of implementation and having a useful 1.0 spec. That because um, you know I can also see people saying, "Why do I have to make multiple calls just to just to remove a whole order when it would be a single operation to implement?" Um, yeah, my thinking there was uh, in in terms of that simplification was that most kinds of cancellations would probably be more at the item level, um, but but I don't know. That's based on nothing, um, so you can so I can see the argument for doing both. Yeah, well, I go and go back to your example of where um, I'm booking with a friend. Uh, if I'm cancelling yeah. my friend's cancelling, so it's simpler if I just delete the whole thing. True. True. Forcing, uh, just you know, disaggregation of multiple tickets. Um, the other thing uh, is, uh, I think last time we had quite a long discussion about um, why it would be useful to have um, 
uh, a two-phase cancellation? So we did, and so uh, further thinking on this and discussion uh, has led us to this design here. So what, what then happens next is a great prompt. Um, as soon as you've deleted that thing, um, so that's that back and forth. Uh, so I've got that point, we should include order level, the order item level. Um, what then happens, and this is key because it's consistent um, with the next diagram, so the order comes back onto the RPD feed with custom cancelled. Um, and if you just go to the next diagram, you'll see very similar, except it's just this bit, except it's seller cancelled. And so in both cases, there's a, there's a cancellation triggered. Um, and in the case where, in this case, uh, the seller's done it. So that's just, it's just done. And in the previous case, it's the customer that's done it. And in both cases, what that does is it puts it on the feed. And then as, the idea here is as soon as that cancellation goes on the feed, it's then the broker's responsibility to process that refund, rain or shine. And as far as the booking system is concerned, that's the done deal. They put it on the feed, that's the end of their responsibility. There's no feedback loop that then changes the state in the booking system from refund requested to refund confirmed or anything like that. Um, because as the booking system doesn't need that level of granularity. Um, and, uh, and, and thinking here is that practically, if the refund doesn't succeed, what, whose problem is that and what's the action that would then be taken? Uh, and basically, if the, if the thing is cancelled, the refund needs to happen. If the refund doesn't happen, that customer is going to be annoyed, probably with the broker um, not receiving their refund because you know, that's the thing they've been told they're going to get. Um, but there's no, there's no um, situation where you would say to a customer, um, you know, you're, you know the, the, the venue got flooded, so we've issued a refund to everybody, but because your card didn't work, you're not allowed one, sorry. Um, it, would, it wouldn't be the case that, you know, just because you're, some technical failure occurred, you're not allowed the refund. The refund is, the term, is, is going to go ahead. The question is really then, can it be processed? If it can't be processed, it's down to the broker to continue to retry and, and deal with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah, understand that we you need to have that uh, clear responsibility. But um, one of the reasons for having two phase was for, so that the booking system could also be clear when the broker has uh, processed the refund. So that, uh, you know, following the principle we've got elsewhere that both sides of the system always have, you know, knowledge of where things are at. Um, I think in this model here, um, the booking system won't have any way of knowing that the, you know, if somebody rings up questioning whether something was successfully uh, refunded or not, or when the refund's going to take place, the booking system hasn't been notified. But I think, you know, I think Nick's right here. That's the responsibility of the broker. Yeah. And so as far as the booking system is concerned, um, they want to get paid. And that's why we have two phase commit. If some of these cancelled either through seller request or the booking system request, um, then they say, okay, it's been cancelled. You've asked for it to be cancelled. Uh, you, Mr. Broker, have to provide a refund. And actually, it's of no real interest to the booking system whether that refund is done or not. Yeah, it's in their accounts, and that will go, you know, that'll be part of any um, uh, reconciliation that happens, but the booking system can't do anything about it. Whereas in the case of a, a booking, if the payment fails, then you want to make sure it's unbooked. In this case, the actual operation of the booking system side is already done. We've already cancelled it. So, uh, and just to add to that, um, the refund may well be asynchronous. So it may well be in the batch mode, you know, every every night as a person in real time. Yeah, 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 I understand that. I, I just think I'm more thinking from a uh, customer service point of view that uh, I think previously we were aiming to make sure that everybody had complete, complete knowledge of the status of the order and the payment. Um, I, this deviates slightly because it means that, that the, the state of that final refund is only held by the broker. So that's consistent, I think, with the previous, um, in the, the previous diagram where we've got those boxes and responsibility. Um, the, in fact, if you maybe jump back up to that, that might be useful. Um, so I think part of the change here is that now that the um, system of record, I think it's 7.1, so I think part of the change here is that the booking system actually has very little knowledge about the payment and refund and invoice situation. Uh, in fact, visibility in this diagram shows they have no visibility of the payments and the refunds and the, and the invoice. 
all the booking system knows is that it has been paid and that they have requested a refund. Um, um, but it, I thought they had, I thought the, the um, uh, broker was passing payment ID through to the booking system. So there was some exposure and I'm, I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is if there's an ID for refunds, why are we not making that available as well? Oh, I see. Well, generally speaking, the refunds are connected to the payment. So in the, so for a strike, for example, the payment is a 15 pound payment. You can then issue refunds against that payment. So the model is, as this diagram shows, um, if you can get the payment, you can get to the refunds. The payment is worth the kind of, total amount at any one point so if you've got a 15 pound payment but there's a refund of five pounds against it that payment is now really worth 10 pounds and so uh, as long as that reconciles with what the booking system is expecting um then then at the end of the month when they true up their booking system versus the broker's payment system that all should come out uh but i suppose yeah so so i suppose there's a, that's the I'm trying to think if there's another way of because basically what it comes down to is the booking system having a state of refund requested and what what you know what useful how useful that is really um because the, the challenge there is it makes it much more complicated to i mean it's not just the delete at the moment it's very far and forget um and i suppose the reason the other reason it's far and forget is because for a provider triggered cancellation there is also no option um, if the provider triggers the cancellation, then it, it, again the broker just has to deal with that, um, and so there's not there's not really an option to, to to kind of argue with the provider. No, I don't want this to be cancelled. It's it, it, it's a done deal. Um, no, I know they they will have to do that. They have to process the broker has to process the the refund. But again, I was I would have expected in that scenario as well that the booking system may want confidence that every you know because it's been flooded that they know that everybody has been properly refunded so i suppose this might be where it comes to the the, the broker needs to um maybe that's not something to the, for the broker to, to 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 offer or or something um uh but okay well let's take sounds like there's a there's a slight um a, a question about that maybe that's something we can ask um some other people and see if there's if, if that's something that the booking system wants, sounds like Legend's not so interested in that, but others might be. Uh, so uh, that's a good question. Yeah, and um, my other feedback is just uh, whether a delete is the right right verb to use. Mm, I wondered whether you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, I started out with it was started out as a patch. It became a delete just because it was the most simple thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I can see that. Um, okay. So just to kind of uh, cover off the last couple of bits then. So that's, that's mainly the, uh, the, the, those diagrams kind of cover that. Uh, there are a couple of other things I wanted to point out. And so maybe if we do 7.6, Ian, I know you've, we've only got six minutes left. So maybe just going back to that, because you had a comment earlier. Yes, I didn't understand it. Yeah, I wasn't I, quite I, sure who was um, providing the override, whether it's going uh, whether the um, broker was saying, oh, you said it's £7.50, but it's going to be £4. Or whether it's part of the order request, um, £7.50, oh, but we'll do it for you for £4. I, I wasn't sure which direction it was in. Oh, I see. So, yeah, so the idea with this is this is this is that um, uh, requirement from the, I can't remember which of the work, booking workshops, one of the things where we were saying that the, the, the value of price um, variabilization um, in this is, is, a, is a, a strong thing that all the, all, the, all the innovators want to have freedom to, uh, to do. And, as, and maybe it was even Stephen Winfield that said that it should be these kind of things are up to the, the commercials to decide on what the prices are at the end of the day. Um, so if for some reason there's an, there's an agreement to change the price of the thing, um, that that should be done only at the time of order, not in in some kind of kind of uh, detailed uh, database level thing in, in in the booking system. So it's not like creating a new price level or creating a new whatever. It's just the case that the broker can just say, "I've actually I've actually got permission uh, as as broker whatever to to do this for four pounds." And so if it's got permission to do that and they've got the commercials in place, um, they can simply submit an accepted offer when they do the booking so that's that's in the quote and then subsequently in b uh, as they would with any other offer that would be accepted but instead of taking an offer id 
um, which is one that's been provided in the feed, uh, they just simply provide an offer override, which is a price and a, and a, and a currency, which then is, is then taken. I think we said this in one of the previous um, uh, discussions that Ray was in as well. As long as that's, it's got to be the same uh, tax type, so uh, tax gross or whatever it is. Um, it's got to be consistent. Uh, it's also got to be, um, well, it's just, yeah, that, that number is there. And then whatever tax rules would have been applied had the value of this, the, the item actually been that amount in the first place would then be applied and everything carries on as it normally does. Okay, my only real concern there is that um, uh, should the, broker, should the um, provider, should the seller not be able to say, no, I'm not doing that for £10. Because, you know, I mean, th this whole thing about what the commercial relationship is still in its infancy. And I don't think that Stephen had in mind that this is, it's a squash court for £10. Oh, yes, you can sell it for a pound. I think there'd be some kind of range which is acceptable. And, you know, you've got not only, really, I'm obviously assuming that none of, the, none of the brokers are going to be dishonest anyway, but mm. they can make mistakes and cutting mistakes. And um, it doesn't feel like it's tightly tied up to me. But I think I think what Stephen's point with that was I can kind of see where he's coming from. It's, it's almost that that's that's a problem for the commercial side in that you know when they do the reconciliation when they because obviously they'll they'll be reporting on this what how much income there is and how much is all that kind of stuff. Um, when that that process happens, if there's stuff that's happening that's untoward, i.e., not within the bounds of their agreement, which they'll need to be properly kind of checking against, not just for this but for for, for everything, you know, what they've booked versus what they've not booked. If they said they're only going to touch off peak courts and they start booking on peak courts and you know all, all kinds of things um, that might might not be in the bounds of that agreement, that they would need to have that um, check and balance between them. So I suppose this is the same kind of thing. It's just a, you know, it, it's another one of those if. If someone starts abusing it, as you say, they probably would quickly lose their permission to do any further booking. Imagine there's a big red button that can be pressed. Just, yeah. Can I just throw a little complication in there, which we'll probably ignore straight away. If you're going to do that, then the price you charge for the squash court as an override would depend on when it was selling it. So if you're selling it off peak, then you don't make it coming down to four pounds because you're better than nothing. If you're selling it peak, then you probably want to manage that. So the agreement may be something like, um, yeah, the peak price is £25, off-peak price is £10, mm. it's the off-peak price only. And how would the broker know it's off-peak rather than peak? I suppose it's, in some systems, the offer that exists that you would be overriding has that information. Um, but it, but I, again, this is one of those things that, you know, okay. if they need yep. to ma manually code it in, so I, I, I think this should be out of scope for 1.0. Um, I, I think we've, what we'd said at the workshops is that what we would be trying to do is not get in the way of business model, experimentation with business models. I don't remember seeing a strong requirement for dynamic variable pricing driven by the broker because I don't think we got into any of that because we, we deliberately parked it. Um, so... I think my preferred option would be to, uh, at a kind of high level in the specification, identify the range of business models and pricing models that, that are currently supported. And if there are things like broker side variable pricing that is not yet in there, that we just clarify that that has not been standardized yet, rather than trying to um, cover everything for, for 1.0. Because I, 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 don't, I don't know how many people need this in order to um you know drive forward the implementation of, of booking mm. maybe this is something we should we should be asking with there's more brokers on the call to um to, to, to say their, their view on that like i my, my impression from different people is that it's, um, that it's something that would be quite useful tom i don't know if you have any view on this yeah i was just going to chime in there um my view would be um it would be really useful um and to kind of leave that as flexible as possible but at the same time I guess it's it's further down the line and if it was still in mind for the next iteration of this then and that would be fine if it was going to hold hold it up in any sense but um, yeah that would be useful for us to have the option for dynamic and variable pricing but actually how we're going to implement that at this early stage is still to be known so yeah that's my position on it. 
I mean, we, because we haven't done any like serious uh, review with the community of what what business models people are going to put in place. I, I'm wary about introducing stuff that may may not be uh, may not be workable or may not cover all of the requirements. Sure, I think I think it's probably worth us um, um, yet yeah, yeah, getting some further feedback on this and 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 seeing whether i mean the main main thing is looking through all the various options of what's possible here from what i can see this is the only thing that is there's nothing there's no other business models here that this doesn't cover if that makes sense there's nothing else because because basically everything the invoicing is completely up to the um broker and the and the method of payment is completely up to the broker and so the flexibility and they can charge additional charges on top if they want to do that separately the tax rules are all in there so they can do basically they can do anything they want to do except for this uh because the booking system ultimately holds the keys to the um reconciliation in, in this respect so um that's the this is that's the only reason this is in here it's just because that's the, last, the only thing that is is restricted um and i just to be something significant but yeah let's um let's make sure we we um round up some people who have views on this stuff yeah okay well I, I'm gonna remind us that we did we did round up people and we did have a list of requirements for 1.0 so um, in order because we need to get this agreed and, and finished um, so that people can start implementing it and then thinking about what future iterations were we need to keep coming back to the stuff that the community had agreed to yeah, totally agree. Um, well, it, it, yeah, my main thing here is that this, although this is this is a paragraph in here, if it's in terms of implementation, not hugely contentious, it's not the thing that's holding us up. If it is the thing that's going to take, you know, lots of debate around how we do it rather than whether we should do it, then maybe that's a, yeah. a thing. But um, I mean, there's, I mean there's, even, there's even more stuff in here because there's new failure modes because not everyone might support this or might want to reject stuff. There needs to be more context in the specification about where and when this is appropriate to do, and what the relationship between the broker and the booking system needs to be in order for somebody to be able to use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not it's an other paragraph. Sure. Okay. I think I think is it if it doesn't hold it up, then it's, if there's I'm I'm just not sure on what the outcome is. If it's included, uh, it'd be better if it was included. But if it is actually going to hold it up in any significant way, then I think it's worth putting in, in in the next iteration. But having this included um, and making it possible from a booking system standpoint, does that need the input of the community? When it, I think, I think it was brought up before, and I think if it's not utilised, is that a problem at this instance? Does that makes sense. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's. I just can't see the problem. In I'm in kind of two minds, to be honest, because I think that uh, we did uh, we did talk about this um, at some point. Uh, I think that Nick, we talked about this in our first session with the Legend customers, going back a year, mm. um, because they do want you know not to charge a price that's recorded in the system. They want the brokers to be able to have the flexibility to do that. <laughs> It's actually more work for us because we don't, you know, if we have a, a price in the system, the price that we're charging comes back, then we've got to manage the way that's done. It's not a huge amount more, um, so I don't have a, a, a bad vibe about it. But I also think that it may not be the right mechanism. Yeah, because this is a very open mechanism. And um, how do we account for it, for example? Uh, you know, what GL code is attached to this? Is it going to be the same for every kind of thing, or do we need to be able to manage that? Do we need a type of why it's a price over? But is it is it a promotion? Is it a standard agreement? Is it because it's Friday? So um, uh, the concern I've really got is I think this would do eighty twenty, but it may be the twenty it doesn't do these quite a different structure, and that's really what I'd be concerned. One thing else, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. And I, I, I suppose that's what this was going for is just like you say, it's the extent of the, because I think, I suspect, I suspect when we get into the actual, you know, implementation of people using this in the wild, um, then those, those other requirements will kind of be shaken out a little bit in terms of people saying what they need and how it works and, and things like that. And um, there's nothing to stop us removing it in this future version as well if, 
you know, if it was causing challenges or anything like that. I mean, it would be extremely simple for a booking system to spray a seller to stipulate that this must not be used to the broker. Uh, and then, you know, and obviously if they, if they were good to go outside of that contractual relationship, that would be their relationship over. Uh, I don't think any broker is going to want to, to risk anything like that. So speaking as someone who's desperately trying to end of life a number of our features and functionalities, it's very difficult to take something out once you put it in. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, a, a booking system is going to have to implement at least a, a check to make sure that this doesn't happen if they're not supported by overrides at all or with individual brokers. So there'll need to be something in their system to, to track that. I don't think it's going to be pushed out to it'd be unsafe to just accept uh, orders that have offer overrides and hope that, that, that things are okay. Yeah, I guess so. well, I suppose it, it, there's already the, 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 the brokers already implemented uh, invoices as well. So, but um, I see what you're saying. It's, it's, it, it depends on how much we're trusting the broker in the scenario and um, how, much, how much we think, think that contractual relationship is, is kind of versus the, the technical. Side. Um, but anyway, so I yeah. sure sounds like there's a, there's a there's a good um, question about this and, um, and the complexity of it. Um, Apart from that, it sounds like the other the other thing we need to think about is whether we have orders versus order items in the feed, um, and so they're the two remaining big questions. Yeah. I, I I'd be very keen that we keep his orders. Right. Um, I mean, it binds about it, but it just keeps it uh, just keeps it clean. Mm. Yeah, because the, um, the the booking system can store an order. Uh, the broker, sorry, can store an order, and then it, it, it's got the whole thing coming in. I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of forget what I said. I've got mixed feelings about it. Because the other thing is that if you to say, I'm going to have a feed that changes the order, you've got an item with 100, an order with 100 items in it, and one item changes, that's a lot of work to construct the, the order of pushing it out. Whereas just saying, oh, something's been cancelled. Yeah, that's less work and less overhead for it. So, I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, we've, we've run over time. Um, just, uh, I think, two things to wrap up. I've got um, actually a question for Izzy, if she's still there. Um, and then um, a question for Nick. I'll do Nick's um, I am still here, yes. Okay, great. Well done, um, persevering, Izzy. Um, the, so, question for it's Nick. It's very uh, helpful, I think, but uh, yeah, sometimes goes in my head a little bit. Anyway. Um, so, Nick, so there's, there's obviously a couple of uh, key areas where you want some further feedback. Um, other than that, I, you, I, is the spec stable? So, pending wider input, have you got further edits to do? So the main thing that needs to happen now, assuming that we're everyone's on board with this, is that the model needs to be fleshed out in more detail to include the kind of the fields and things like that. So at the moment, 9.1 um, is is a just an example model that includes a bunch of stuff. I know Ian kind of had, had some questions about whether all of this stuff is necessary. Um, uh, basically, the, the the remaining bit of this that's needed is to um, flesh that out in detail. So probably a table per object, as we've done in other specs, with the detail about what each of those fields means, um, and then um, uh, yeah, and then that's some cleanup at the end of the spec around error handling to make sure that all ties up. But if if these questions are kind of resolved, I think we're out the other side of the kind of main points of contention because we've effectively simplified everything out. We've, we've, we've got rid of a lot of the stuff that we had in there before. Okay, um, so in terms of trying to like, kind of get the final convergence then, can I suggest that uh, for section nine, um, and then the other kind of couple of sections where we've, we've highlighted things today, yeah. that you add a, um, a notes section in, just to say either we need feedback on this, and then give a link to a GitHub issue, where we can collect by the comments, or for section nine, this still needs work. Um, and then uh, submit this to the rest to the rest of the uh, standards group just by the mailing list. Mm -hmm. um, because then we can um, continue, because I'm conscious that, you know, at the minute we're checking every couple of weeks, there've been some quite substantial changes. It'd be nice just to get into refining the details now. And I think we should be able to do that part of it, those discussions at GitHub. 
Um, so it just gets back to the, um, yeah, to that kind of ongoing uh, commenting. Um, sure. But also just gives a sign to everybody that we are starting to get closer to, to 1.0. But that, that makes a lot of sense and I'll, I'll raise these two remaining issues as issues in github and reference them um that's probably a good thing to do okay. yeah yeah uh, and, then, and then sorry go ahead tom um what are the next steps necessary for 1.0 to be finalized just these couple of points um mentioned on the call today or is there anything outside of that those sound like the, the big areas. I think that um, uh, there might be a few, you know, uh, bits of feedback on wording or other aspects of the, the spec. I think because we've only re because there's been such a lot of changes in the last few weeks, um, uh, I think we need to give people a, a bit of an opportunity to digest the spec for those, particularly those that haven't been able to make all of the calls. So that, there may be some other issues that people surface, uh, but. Um, uh, I think we just need to give time for that to happen, basically. Okay. Is there a kind of um, bait that you're shooting for at all? Um, 2017, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Last year. Um, uh, so it's roughly, like, so the, the the process we've tried to follow previously was to get to a spec where we think we've addressed all of the outstanding issues give people a kind of notice that we were going to put a proper 1.0 rubber stamp on it. So I think we need to give people at least another couple of weeks in order to do a review and surface any other issues. Mm. I would suggest we take stock then on the next call uh, to see how, how many issues have come up. Um, but if, you know, if things are all fine, then we've, we've dealt with them. It, we, it might be just another couple of weeks before we do that rubber stamp. It may be that it's, uh, we need to give it another couple of weeks for revisions. Just okay. from my perspective, um, I mean, I had, I uh, for once actually did some preparation. Nick, you'd be proud of me. Yes. Um, but I kind of got, it took me about an hour to get about a third of the way through because it's dense stuff. Um, and I need really at this point to start putting real developers behind it because, you know, I am know stuff, but I, I could do with a real developer looking at this and say, oh, yes, well, but not. Mm. And I think that overall thing, to actually get it formally approved, will need discussion inside, particularly the larger organisations, and, and a bit more stamping at their levels. So I think we need to be just aware of that. And I think we need to get to a, um, a version which the, the group here feels is about right. Then I think there will be another, another step where we get that rubber stamp within, within various organisations. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a good shout. I mean, we'd also talked about trying to get some people to do some implementations before we did the rubber stamping. But I'm just, uh, that needed to be at a point when we were reason, reasonably stable. Yeah, uh, I mean, we certainly wouldn't be able to implement, do this implementation in a, a reasonable time frame. There's, there's a lot of work for us to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. But someone who's already kind of implemented most of it may be able to help there. Mm. Yes, and there's a couple of people who are, um, are looking at doing it in the, the shorter term. I, I'm Pete from Clubspot couldn't make it today, but I know they're, they're looking uh, very short term to get get something together. So, so does that? It sounds like that means that the next step. So, wrapping this up and, and, and getting this out so that this group can feed back on the detail in GitHub issues. That's two weeks plus two weeks uh, potentially, and then we're into the developers looking at it sounds like and that's another two weeks plus two weeks so we're two months off i hadn't thought it would be that bad i would have thought in two weeks if if we can get a, a final draft with all the changes there's a lot to do sorry um i think there's a lot of detail to trim through i don't think there's a lot to do but that's still work yeah i i think it's i think this the change is very positive nick by the way i think it's, it's come forward well um, so I think in two weeks' time, when we should be in a position, if you get it to us a few days beforehand, not not half that beforehand, <laughs> yeah, for us to have a chance to read through it, and we need a couple, two, three, four, maybe in a clear week, to be honest, mm. it's, it's it's time to read it. Yeah. And then if we agree to that, then two or four weeks, something like that, to get it agreed internally. But we kind of need to get the devs from all our teams, and in fact, for all the um, all the participants teams zoomed up so we can schedule their time in for three weeks from now to say read this spec you'll like it 
Okay, so what it, so what it, I think on that basis then, if we aim for the, in two, so we've got, we give the next two weeks for the, the Open Active Community Group to, to comment on this draft with, you know, uh, there might be some revisions from Nick, but he's going to annotate which bits are about to change. Um, and then we say to the community that a month after that is when we're aiming for 1.0. So we want wider review. Uh, if people want to do some prototyping within that period, then they've got a, a date to shoot for. And that, that also gives time for that um, internal review that, that you were suggesting, Ian. Um, that means that the, uh, the call in a month's time, we could make that a um, uh, another, just an, a high level walkthrough as a kind of tutorial. Um, so not go into the details necessarily, but just kind of use it as a way to do a kind of refresher through the, the API spec for everybody who hasn't been able to make it. So we can kind of give people plenty of notice that that's what we're going to do. One thing I'd like to suggest is that somewhere at the beginning of this, we have um, a, a noddy guide to the process. I, I like flow diagrams or process diagrams because you kind of got to read through about 30 pages before you actually understand what the workflow is. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think there's a, there's a role for, so this is the formal specification and we can produce swagger specs as well as a, as a kind of reference point. But I think there also needs to be at some point a tutorial, like how, how do you go about implementing it? There's other kind of um, documentation that we're going to need to go with this. So rather than try and put all of that in the, in the spec, um, I guess I was kind of thinking of the diagrams that Nick's got, but in one place at the beginning. Right, okay. Yeah, so that you've got, this is how you do an order, this is how you get blah, blah, blah. So you don't have to understand everything before you understand the kind of high level stuff. Just a thought. Okay. I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love that. I mean, part of the, uh, section one, two, three, and four are uh, bit really quite boilerplate. Uh, section five starts the user journey and straight into diagrams. I tried to re re remove as much before section uh, five as possible, but um, you could tell everyone to start at section five and ignore everything before that because you don't really need to read it. And I, I guess maybe I can ask Lee about whether we need uh, um, anything before, sorry, section four. So section uh, section three, typographical conventions, which is not that much, but maybe All not. Right. All right. And then you know, conformance to section two is a very boilerplate thing. Um, yeah, some of that's auto generated by the spec tool. So yeah, and then the introduction and the scope and stuff, that's all quite again boilerplatey, but it's context setting. Yeah, I mean you could put uh, yeah, I think the context is useful. I mean we could just add a um, a reader's guide as a section after one point two or something. Like which bits you want to go to. But yeah, let, let's discuss that uh, separately. Um uh so that I think we've got uh some idea of kind of key dates there um so we'll, we'll follow up and, and share that more widely um what i wanted to check in with you about izzy and this is a kind of complete context switch is i know you were talking to a few people about um uh disability describing events etc and facilities yes. with disabled people is there yeah. anything you want to update us on on that discussion yeah so um if you cast your minds back to, I think it was September or October, we had a, a kind of session on, on this call where we started to talk about what the um, accessibility um, stuff might look like. And I've had a few conversations, mainly with an organization called Activity Alliance, who are um, essentially, uh, they worked with a range of different people with disabilities to kind of help make sport more accessible. Um, I think there's, a real interest in how they um, could help us kind of redefine the kind of data that we're capturing potentially even about accessibility because I think um, the feedback I've got so far on on the two bits of the spec which kind of are focused on accessibility are that they're a kind of a good starting point but they they don't really capture the breadth of things that people need to know and I think there's um, I think in this, uh, forgive me, I'm going to re not remember any of the technical titles of what all the fields are called, which is not very helpful. Um, but uh, I think there's one which has kind of quite a lot of potential tick boxes that includes like a real range of things like pregnancy, suitable, um, people with different health conditions that has cancer, has a wheelchair accessible. I mean, there's a, there's a real kind of um, well-intentioned mishmash, I think is, is maybe a fair to say, of, of different things. Um, 
so um, there's also kind of a few different organizations from different parts of the um, sector around disability who've been in touch. So um, Botcher have been in touch about potentially opening up some theatre. Um, I haven't got a call with them, lined up with them yet, but that'll happen in the next week or so just to find out where they're at and how that's kind of going and, and what support they want. Um, and also Parasport, so BP, uh, the British Paralympic Association are looking to revamp their kind of Parasport platform, which is essentially a website where people go to um, find different opportunities for um, uh, to get involved in, in, in disability friendly sport. Um, all of these different organisations have a slightly different view of uh, the kind of data we might need to capture, which is going to be an interesting challenge. But um, I think there's a there's a bit of a moment happening potentially that um, I think at the right point we'll need to capitalise on. And I think actually um, the other thing I'd wanted to pick someone's brain on is um, while the kind of booking stuff is happening, is there something that I can push forward or is there something that I can kind of, because what I have done is directed um, Activity Alliance back to that video call that we did way back when as like a, that was the mm -hmm. last group discussion we had and just to get some of their feedback on what their initial thought, thoughts were on the two bits of the standard that cover accessibility, what else we might need to capture as a sort of starting point, but I'm sure there's other things we could be doing. Yeah, so what, what I, would, I think there is, there is a way to kind of progress some of that in parallel. So what I would suggest is uh, we start to pull together a, a discussion document, could just be a Google Doc, uh, maybe a kind of Activity Alliance put down what their thoughts are around um, what data should be collected. Um, and then we give the opportunity for other people to um, uh, chime in on that, see whether they agree, disagree, so we can start to see where there is some alignment or some dis discussion required before we drop into you know discussing the data structures in more detail so we can just see you know we can we can start to do some of that groundwork around what the use cases are um, with you know with a more kind of informed view from some of those organizations that okay great okay? yeah that sounds perfect um i will um because i think the other thing which i know is kind of in the in the longer term roadmap but it'd be good to know is if there's a point which this gets picked up because i think that helps people to forward plan i know that's a wider discussion for the open active stuff as well but yeah yeah well again i mean some some of the the kind of uh, planning uh, sorry, some of the time frames for that might depend on how uh, aligned people are um, yeah <laughs> you know if everyone agrees okay we just need these extra fields with this this vocabulary in it then we could you know there's no reason why we can't do that quite quickly yeah. Uh, but I suspect it, there's going to be a process of discussion and so there might be a, a variety of ways that we facilitate that. Yeah, okay perfect. Um, well I'll find somewhere to put a shared Google Doc and then um, I'll ask Activity Alliance to feed into it. I'll put in, I can dig out the relevant bits of the spec and make sure you guys can make sure they've picked out the right bits, <laughs> um, link to the call, things like that and just try and uh, galvanise people around filling, filling that in. Um, yeah, and share that round, obviously. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. No worries. Um, has, has anybody got anything else uh, before I wrap up the call? Might, might be just worth quickly asking, Roger, are you, do you think you'll be in a position as, as, uh, as Ian would be uh, to kind of do some, uh, have a look at the spec and, and, and due diligence from developers, things like that in, in the next six weeks? Uh, could, could, could you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we'll, uh, we'll need to we'll just come come across this really the last last week. Um, from what from our position, obviously, from the booking system side, really, it's I mean, we we could do most of the stuff that's in this fact is just coordinate it with everyone else, really. Um, so we we can certainly get things get things moving, have some some conversations in in house. Um, we have a team of developers here who. You know, do this sort of thing. So um, I just need to speak to, to the relevant people here and uh, see if we get these moving. But you know, we'll certainly get uh, some some feedback for you within the six month six week period. Yeah. Excellent. Ah, oh, it's really great. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks for coming along. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, well, thanks to everybody, it's particularly as we've run 25 minutes over today. Um, uh, as, as always, it's really useful discussion. So um, thanks for your contributions and uh, thank you for taking some time in the next two weeks to uh, comment on the, on the spec. Um, and we'll catch up again in the next call in two weeks' time. Okay. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye.